All right. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We are fortunate enough to have uh, Laura Nichols here with us today. Uh, Laura is a art historian and lecturer at the Desmond Campus and the Oasis Project uh, in Orange County. Uh, she's joined us for many programs in the past, and I hope many more in the future. And today she's here to talk about uh, the art and life of Norman Rockwell. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening uh, from home. And uh, can you um, see the full screen, everybody? Yes? Okay, so I'm starting with this image. And um, this image was done in 1945. It's a very sweet image. It was one of a group of images that Norman Rockwell uh, produced during the war years. And it is um, it was actually uh, done for uh, the Saturday Evening Post in, in uh, uh, from his home in Arlington, Vermont in those years. But why I'm starting with this image, and I'll give you the little background story for it, the image, which is called Home for Thanksgiving, was uh, created, um, uh, you know, as a as a, a Saturday evening post editor, but it was created using real people and uh, a farmer's wife, Sarah Helgwig, and her son Richard, who had just returned home from, um, you know, who's an air pilot. He had just returned home uh, to his dairy farm, uh, his family dairy farm. And uh, they were neighbors of Norman Rockwell and, and Rockwell produced this as a very poignant image. Well, the image uh, came into the hands in the 1950s uh, of a Catholic priest who then donated it plus $500, donated it in 1959 to the Massachusetts American Legion Post uh, in nearby, nearby to um, uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And for the past, say, since 1960, so for the past 50, 60 years, the museum, had the, the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge has been loaned this image and, um, you know, by the Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts American Legion. And, um, and it has been, you know, a well-loved, uh, you know, well-loved example on the walls for all these years. Well, the owners of uh, the, the image, uh, the Massachusetts American Legion Post, uh, decided that they needed to be able to sell the image because their building and, you know, their, their premises was, you know, was well beyond repair. And so they put it up to auction. So this image, uh, home for Thanksgiving, just sold for, to the tune of, um, of uh, four million dollars, and it was sold to Stephen Lucas. And Stephen Lucas, who has a uh, a whole host of images, uh, Stephen Lucas has uh, is is uh, building a, a museum of American narrative art. And I put this there because, uh, you know, I'm starting with this because just to show the popularity, particularly in the past 30 years of Norman Rockwell's images. But now, let me show you something else. About five years ago, the Berkshire Museum, which owned two Norman Rockwells, plus a host of other uh, American paintings, was again in dire financial straits. And they had a Norman Rockwell image called Shuffleton's Barbershop, along with a, a barbershop quartet image that they needed to sell in order to, again, help their, uh, their horrible uh, uh, economical situation. Um, and they were in deficit $1.5 million a year. And so they put up a, a series of, of images, two of which, which had been given to the Berkshire Museum by Norman Rockwell himself in the late 50s and early 60s as a thank you to the museum director for storing some of the uh, some of his paintings and, and you know documents over the years when he was living in uh, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Well, in this created this created this idea of the museum selling gifted material, uh, you know, on the open market. It created quite a, a you know a, a procedure uh, for in the in the law because as a gift, does the museum have the right to sell? Uh, paintings. And it, it was deemed that they could. And so this particular painting um, was, per, was sold for $25 million. And, and Stephen Lucas also bought this, uh, uh, bought this painting. And if you look in the lower right hand corner, Lucas and his wife are creating the Lucas Museum of Art of Art in LA. It's scheduled to open in 2023. And he has already purchased 
13 uh, Norman, Rockwell museum, uh, Norman Rockwell paintings, as well as numerous drawings, as well as other um, particularly American narrative images uh, that cross the boundaries of, of, of the years, but also cross the boundaries of, of gender and, and uh, um, uh, you know, race and socioeconomic opportunities. And it's, it's very interesting because in his museum, uh, and he is a filmmaker, but in his museum, it's filled with narrative art. And up until fairly recently, say perhaps the last 30 or 40 years, narrative art was one, once thought as film, flimsy, you know, really superficial, so thought as illustrative. And Norman Rockwell, as an artist, was thought to be and is an illustrator. But in the fine art world, he was never really considered a fine artist. But Stephen Lucas really appreciated uh, the, the artwork of uh, Norman Rockwell. And he then, you know, is, is, you know is, is very much a connoisseur of that and then is really highlighting him in his, his museum himself. So who is Norman Rockwell? Well, Norman Rockwell during the course of his life became a, an artist of the narrative. He became an artist uh, and a, uh, uh, an illustrator appealing to everyday people by using everyday characters doing everyday thing things but also appealing to the sense of humor that he particularly had and as you see as as you will see you'll see how he developed from say a, a you know a slightly academic artist but through his own course of of his own being he put his personality into the paintings themselves so um, Rockwell was born in, in February 1894, and you would think he would be a, uh, you know, born in New England, but he wasn't. He was born, uh, as he would say, I wasn't born in a Tweedy town, but I was born on 100 and Street in a, and Amsterdam Avenue. And he was raised in a series of, of uh, apartments, apartment buildings uh, in, in New York City in uh, you know what is now uh, Harlem and his parents his parents weren't upwardly mobile his father worked in the textile industry his his mother was pretty much a recluse and he always talked about her as being a hypochondriac and so at, at one point uh, the family moved to Mamaroneck New York and they didn't last there very long but to continue that when they lived in the city and at, when they were young when Norman as, and his brother uh, were young they would, the parents would take them up to the farms in, uh, in, in upper New York state in and around Amenia and Chatham and up and through that area there. And they found that the farmers would, you know, in order to help their uh, financial situation, they would rent out rooms. So Rockwell had these, these lovely uh, uh, memories of uh, being a young child in, uh, in the farmlands there, because he talked about, he talked about the fact that, you know, when he was in the farm, <clears throat> when he was on the farm, he was able to go out and play with the farmer's kids and, and do all kinds of, of happy things. And he said, the summers I spent in the country as a child became part of this idealized view of life. It was very much a happy dream, but I wasn't a country boy. I didn't like that kind of life, except later on in my paintings. And, you know, so, so this early part of his life was framed in the city, a short stay in Manmarinek, the family had to move back to the city where then he talks about in the city, we kids, we kids delighted to go up on the roof and then spit down on the passersby below. But we never did things like that in the country, the clean air, the green fields and the thousands of things I love to do, you know. So there was this disparity of life there uh, where he had, you know, the best of the city, but then he had during, you know, several summers of his youth, he had this lovely open freedom in the country life, seeing the country kids Kids and, and you know really idolizing idolizing them in his life there. Well, as a young child and as a young boy, and particularly at the turn of the 20th century, many of, of the youngsters looked to their heroes to book illustrators. And one of the book illustrators that was the heroic uh, illustrator of the time was Howard Pyle. And Howard Pyle illustrated um, you know, the adventure novels of the 19th century. So the swashbucklers or the medieval, uh, the medieval heroics. And so, you know, through these visual, through these visual, uh, you know, the, these visual images. And Pyle was actually, uh, you know, virtually invented the idea of modern design. Um, so <clears throat> he was, 
also Pyle actually moved down to the Brandywine Valley and was also a mentor to N.C. Wyeth, who became a book illustrator and also was the father of Andrew, Andrew Wyeth himself. Um, another of the, these popular images that were uh, available to young people <clears throat> was the images of J.C. Leyendecker. And J.C. Leyendecker was on the opposite you know, of the spectrum of uh, Howard Pyle because <clears throat> Leyendecker painted these sparkling, wholesome scenes of Americana where you know, he also did the arrow shirt collar and he was uh, very, very uh, you know, competitive, but his, his, you know, these very heroic American uh, images more or less painted a picture in, uh, you know, in, in youngsters' mind, in particular, a very young Norman Rockwell. Um, and also, if you can take a look at the bottom right-hand corner, the, the same auction that just, uh, you know, the, where the uh, Thanksgiving, Home for Thanksgiving sold, Lion Decker's Circus Dog, which was a magazine cover, sold for $163,000. So it's very, it's very interesting where, you know, Rockwell has achieved a greater fame than one of his heroes of his youth. Um, so as a youngster, um, uh, you know, when when he was in high school, he never made it through high school. But as a youngster, he worked um, he worked part time jobs and you know doing chores for other people. And he would go into New York City uh, or go down into Manhattan, uh, Lower Manhattan, and go to the Art Students League and uh, take courses t uh, twice a week on a Wednesday and a Saturday. And so it was at this basics where he had his quote quote his formal art training. Um, so. Through, uh, through the Art Students League and the William Merritt Chase School of Art, which William Merritt Chase was an American Impressionist. He learned the academic mode of teaching. And on the left-hand drawing there, if you he, he did this a little bit later in his, his career, but you see where he puts himself at the top of the tree of his artistic life and who his teachers were and, and the, you know, the illustrators. And the, just below Rockwell to the right, you see a man called George Bridgman. Well, George Bridgman was the uh, was the the parameter for for anatomical drawing, and he you know learning how to draw human forms in action and not action there. And and they go even all the way back towards the uh, 18th 17th century there as well. And he always he always looked at himself as being a product of his uh, his environment and his artistic mentoring. So. After his, uh, his bit of education in the Art Students League and, and Chase School of Art, he, as a young man at 19, he became one of the art editors of Boy's Life and uh, for the Boy Scouts and Boy's Life there. And at this point in his life, he started to produce calendar images for the yearly Boy Scouts calendar. But this is the very first recorded, 1913, his very first recorded cover that he did for, um, for Boy's Life here as well. So <clears throat> he was starting to make money. And so he needed to, he wanted to get out of the city. So he moved to New Rochelle. And when he was in New Rochelle, by the way, New Rochelle at the turn of the century, the end of the 19th and early 20th century, New Rochelle was probably the, <clears throat> the place to be for illustrators because 50% of the illustrators in the United States lived in New Rochelle and had studios in, in, in New Rochelle. And 90% of the Saturday Evening Post illustrators uh, were produced by artists who lived in New Rochelle. And, and New Rochelle is on a, a train line straight into New York City. So there was this accessibility. So when he was in New Rochelle, he, he, he had a studio. He, he took a studio with a gentleman called Clyde Forsythe. Clyde Forsythe was also uh, an, a, uh, an illustrator. And he was originally from California, but he came to New York for a stint. And he was illustrating very much like Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth, these these novels for uh, for young 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 boys, adolescent boys, and um, but he also had this very wholesome way of of uh, portraying the American public. And if you look at the two images down at the left, you know the mother with the little baby or the little child collecting apples, and then the uh, you know the football star, you know the hero football star. So the other thing about Clark, Clyde Forsythe is Clyde Forsythe worked for the Hearst Corporation. And it was Clyde Forsythe who encouraged Norman Rockwell to gather up his portfolio and then, uh, you know, and then you know, appeal to uh, the Hearst Corporation to become an illustrator. And in recognition of that, um, well, I'll produce the drawing.
and he dedicated to Clyde Forsyth in, in 1913. And here in 1913, you can start to see the beginnings of where his uh, very unique approach to the American scene is taking place, you know, where the action is taking place, the interest of the of the uh, the characters within the action there, and this very very fine attention to American or or bodies, you know, the, the anatomical form of the bodies there as well. So what happened is that after Clyde Forsythe encouraged him to get his portfolio. Rockwell got his portfolio, he got on a train, he went down to Philadelphia, he went to the offices of Hearst, and right there on the spot, they bought these two paintings. Um, one is the boy with the baby carriage, and the second is the strong, the strong man. And they then became the first, the first magazine covers, the first Saturday evening post covers that he created. And so let's just take a quick look at them. Um, and because he, he used these with models that were from, you know, from New Rochelle. They you know they were local kids from New Rochelle here, uh, where, you know, where he was had his studio. So the boy with the baby, the boy with the baby carriage, he has the three characters, these three little boys that lived in the neighborhood. And here, here it's, you know, it's here, it's on a Sunday. And these two boys on the left are going out to play baseball while the third kid who's still in his, his Sunday best has to take his baby sister out for a ride. So here you have the two kids making fun of him. So here that sense of humor going on there as well. Well, one of the boys, uh, the boys were used in the same paintings, but one of the boys, Billy Payne, the one without the tooth there, Billy Payne <clears throat> posed for many of these images, but Billy Payne was, uh, you know, was a little bit active as a child. And he would get very restless as, as Rockwell was trying to draw him and pose him and get him all moving around there. And he was, you know, he's posing for these images as an 11 or 12 year old child. So he'd sit for a few minutes and then he'd start to jump around. So Rockwell, you know, would pay him by a check. So the check, you know, the checks were found all over the place. So then Rockwell decided, well, he had to pay him in cash. So the cash, the money, you know, was like, okay, you know, he's given a couple of bucks after a couple of series there. So then he then decided in order to keep Billy Payne, you know, calm, he would pay him a quarter every half hour. And so then, you know, it was this quarter system to keep him, you know, to keep him quiet and, and able to hold the pose. On the right hand pose there, you have, uh, you know, the, the circus barker and the, and the, and the, uh, the strong man. Well, at this point in time, you know, this Charles Atlas, uh, you know, was this bodybuilders were, were coming into play and this is about 1916 here. And so the, the strong man, uh, you know, all the children are taking places there of, of the adult situation. And so he's putting it, he's putting reality into the eyes of children here. Um, and he's, again, he's appealing to an American public who in, uh, you know, the middle of the, the teens here are, uh, you know, probably facing, uh, facing uh, the war, uh, which would be coming to the United States in, in, in 1918. So 1917, uh, world, in World War I, President Wilton, Wilson uh, declared a state of war between the United States and Germany. And an idealistic Norman Rockwell, who was in his, uh, you know, his middle 20s, went to enlist for the Navy. Um, he enlisted, but then he couldn't fulfill his term because he was too skinny. And so he was then put to work for the, for the War Commission. And he, he started to create images of admirals and you know the the you know the the upper uh, upper crust of the um, you know the the army and the navy, and so he produced a series of images for them, and he began to through this he began to make his. Uh, you know his name known, uh, particularly through these images there, and, and work started to pour in for him. So if you looked at the image on the left, they remembered me. Here he has you know an image of an, an American soldier uh, at the Hotel Ritz. Very very, and even though he he wasn't on site, but here he has the soldier getting a package from home and all these wonderful things that he was getting uh, from his from his family, like the socks and the food and the letters and all these wonderful things. So they were done, this was done to show the American people that things, even though they were very difficult, things were happy for a, a, you know, a, a youthful soldier receiving a package from home. On the right-hand side, if only mother could see me now, uh, which became the, the cover for Life magazine in 1918, here he has the young soldier um, sewing and, and doing a task that he would never have done at home. And again, you know, these, these types of images
this appeal to the populace, the everyday, the everyday people back in back home in the United States. So after the war, um, uh, you know, he he began to again continue with his with his series of Saturday evening post covers, but they took on a different focus. And the 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 during the twenty and nineteen twenties, particularly in the earlier part of the nineteen twenties, he had several themes going on, and they were based on the innocent views of life, both with children and then young adults, and and that was to to encourage a feeling of you know, a positiveness post, uh, you know, post a very serious situation. So the going fishing, going fishing with the same three children that were used in, uh, you know, the, his first covers, uh, they're a little bit older. So the, the going fishing is the going off to, you know, go fishing. And here you have the two ragtag kids on the outside and the kid in the inside who has all of the best equipment and all of the best clothing and all of that. And, and, you know, they go off to, to go fishing. And when they come home, who catches the fish? Well, the kid that doesn't have, uh, you know, that the kids that don't have the, the fine finesse of the equipment, but they have, you know, the, the, the success of fishing there as well. Um, and so then here's several from the Age of Innocence, um, where the, again, focusing with the children, the sick puppy, um, the little boy has a puppy, he's, to, he's pouring medicine or a cough syrup, trying to take care of his little sick puppy over there. And then the between the acts, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the clown that is, uh, you know, taking, changing his, his costume or changing his, his makeup and working on his makeup. And then on the right hand, summer vacation. Well, you know, if you're a 12 year old kid who, you know, has to get stuck in school all the time, as soon as it gets to summer vacation, you do somersaults and, you know, you gather that all of that uh, energy because now you don't have to look at a schoolroom or a blackboard or a teacher for the next two and a half months. Um, again, it, Lion Decker did a very similar scene with the with the clown, um, you know, the, and that's the painting that Lion Decker sold. But Lion Decker and and Rockwell have two very different styles. With Lion Decker, and if you can compare the two, Lion Decker was very controlled and very hard edged, um, and and very very masculine, whereas uh, Rockwell's uh, clown is a, a little bit more humane, and as far as uh, you know, the character himself, middle aged, he's not so well built, and he's doing an everyday for him an everyday task of, of taking off his med his make makeup there as well. And then you have the dreams, particularly post World War One, the dreams of youth um, in the age of romance. Well, a young boy, you know, a studious young boy is is reading, and he's picturing himself as a chevalier, um, and he's dreaming of 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 being a hero and in, in some point of his life, and the escape to adventure. The magazine illustrator, perhaps himself, perhaps people he knows, again, they're doing these mundane drawings and tests where he foresees himself or foresees the adventure going on in his, his mind and then starts to portray that in front on the, on, the, on the canvas in front of him. And the law student, well, the law student then has to do his studies in whatever situation he can, whether they're in a GI Bill or not in a GI Bill, but they're studying in the most mundane situations in order to get ahead with themselves in their life. Well, love, well, isn't love sweet? And love for young adults and the serenade with the little, the, you know, the young boy uh, plays his little uh, harmonium there for the, for the young girl, the moonlight buggy ride, um, and then the sunset yet again, these, these very sweet images that every, bay, every people could recognize and, and relate to them because they tell a story. And then downhill daring, these scenes of adventure, um, the, the, you know, building this, this little go-kart going up to the top of the hill and scooting down the hill there, um, going off hiking, you know, walking, hiking became a popular pastime during the 1920s, as did hobos, you know, hobos, um, you know, during, as with the poverty, would go and steal things or ride underneath trains. But then again, capturing the the uh, the familiarity of it, but also capturing it through a sense of humor. And, and the Doctor and the Doll. The Doctor and the Doll. This is a very popular uh, series of of uh, uh, 
uh, posters or for the posts um, because they were they uh, they were used with a um, a model called Pop Frederick and Pop Frederick had wanted to be an actor but if he didn't he didn't really get very far in acting and he had this he, he you know he it didn't work out for him but he became a a, a, fi a fine model for um, rock paintings image on the left hand side there. He paints the doctor in a very typical, you know, situation. You know, a whole a old time family doctor who a little girl brings her doll to the to the doctor himself, and he goes along with it. And so, you know, the you, you get the anxious look on the child's face, and you get this very very patient look of the doctor. You know, he has to in order to please the child, he has to do that. He's very kindly looked itself. Um, but then you get to look at the, the, the little details is with Rockwell, in addition to the, the big, the narrative of it, you always look to the little details. And you look to the details in the doctor and the doctor image on your left here, and look at the candles. And one is nice and straight. And the one on the right is a little, a little bit on an angle. It's not not very straight there itself. He used uh, Pop Frederick in, in these two, uh, least, least of these two. One was a Santa image, uh, you know, in December image. And then one was Ben Franklin down at the lower right hand corner. Um, the excuse my dust was a family a family uh, uh you know family image and again he used uh, a family in new rochelle as their models and he was using everyday neighbors and you know people that he came in acquaintance in a, in a uh, acquaintance with and so these was the campion family from new rochelle but in this image on the left excuse my dust you see two cars and you see the campion family in there beat up old Ford that is out racing the more uh, ex expensive uh, red car down in the foreground there as well. On the right hand side, you see Welcome to en El Elmville. And Elmville uh, was a fictitious town, but he, uh, you know, again, it's based on, based on real life. Um, and Norman Rockwell, who again, you know, he had gone up as a child, he had gone up to, uh, uh, the Eastern, you know, Duchess and, and um, Ulster, well, Duchess County, Putnam County and Columbia County. So Amenia, he had, this is based on uh, Amenia and it, it's, it's uh, Rockwell traveled to Amenia in New York, quote, quote, back in the time when towns paid their taxes with the speeders fine. So again, this is, uh, you know, he talked about how the Amenia cop really nailed him speeding through the town. So again, it's this this kind of humorous uh, reaction to everyday events there. Um, when the when the stock market uh, took a crash in 1929, Rockwell didn't look to the sad part. He didn't look uh, to the poverty and the depression created uh, uh, by the Great Depression there as well. But he looked to other things. And in this stock market quotation, this was uh, a cover that was two, two months after the market crash. Um, he has all of these folks, everyday folks, looking at the stock market quotations, even the dog down at the lower left hand and uh, left hand side. And he realized that, you know, after this cover, after the painting was done, that uh, you know, the painting that the, the, uh, the, the child or the boy on the left, the way that the boy was angled, it looked like he had three legs. And so he shows him lean, leaning forward, the legs are bent, his hands are on his knees, and it looks like, and, and Rockwell realized, it looks like he has a third leg there, but, uh, you know, it's in the back of his pants there as well. Two other images that he did uh, during 1930 in particular, one was Gary Cooper, um, you know, making up for the Texan. And again, you know, the Hollywood films, these adventure films, and particularly Gary Cooper was just coming out as a, a real Hollywood star, but making, making him uh, as an American, you know, doing, a, you know, doing a, 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 like the Hollywood basics there as well. And then the breakfast table, which is a humorous, uh, attempt to you know, goings on of a young couple sitting at the table where she is trying to carry on a conversation and the husband has his nose dug behind the newspaper reading the events of the stock market quotes or whatever. But again, it's this humorous aspect of looking at uh, the, the life as it was happening there as well. Um, here's summer vacation and home from vacation. And again, from the point of view of particularly on the left, the child, a young young kid is now 
you know, free and he's flying, he's flying, you know, in his, it's throwing away his books and he's flying off to have a great vacation, whether it be someplace or not, but particularly having fun, not being in school. And on the, on the home from vacation is a young family um, who have had all of these lovely dreams of going away and go away for a few days. And when they come back, they're exhausted. And so it's the, the after effects of, of having a, a wonderful few days away. Um, parents, child psychology, well, her young mom is reading how to take, you know, how to raise a child. And she's got her little kid on her, on her lap. Um, when the kid is now destroyed everything in, in, you know, in the whole, in the house here, and she is reading what to do, you know, so she's ready to give him a good spanking, but you know, it's that, 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 look on her face that says, well, what should I do? Or how should I do it? Or should I really do it myself? And then the exasperated nanny. Well, nanny has care of children or a child who again is, is ripping up the whole house and she's exhausted and the child doesn't want to do everything she says, but he captures the emotion or he captures the expression of exhaustion or uh, you know, this feeling of desperation about what do I do next? Um, the diary and going out. Well. The diary young women kept all of their secrets in their dreams and their aspirations in their diary or they're going out on a date. And here you have this young woman perhaps coming home from a, a date or perhaps watching a movie or perhaps thinking of herself as a, a uh, you know, as a movie star or whatever and, and just capturing those wonderful instances. And on the next, on going out, um, getting dressed up. And if you've ever seen, you know, ever seen movies of the 1930s and the beautiful costumes that they, they had the, uh, you know, it's particularly the women, these, these very lame costumes, gorgeous costumes there. Well, that was a, a, a fashion, you know, the whole fashion uh, during the, particularly the 30s, the glamour issues that were made very popular by the films. And here you have a young woman dressing up uh, to go out while her baby, her little sister, is looking at her, you know, looking in the mirror and then perhaps dreaming of being her, uh, you know, as she grows up there as well. The Barbershop Quartet. The Barbershop Quartet is a, a, a you know, lovely image here that is, uh, you know, actual foursome here going on, but each face is in the particular, uh, the particular position of, of a note, a particular note there. And so one of them, one of the, uh, one of the, the the fellows, the one that's getting the shave there, holds a copy of a of the Police Gazette, and the picture or the image on the Police Gazette is a scantily clad woman there as well. And then you go to the details. Well, you have the detail of the barber with the the uh, the, the the razor and the mugs and the you know the brush there. You have all of that is uh, you know combined to give the image of the quartet in in. Uh, you know, going, you know, working itself. This particular image was made into a large mural that is outside the Barbershop Harmony Society headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. So again, this very, very uh, harmonious, um, hysterical image of, 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 of life here. 1936, well, you know, Rockwell by 1936, Rockwell had made quite a name for himself, particularly with the Saturday Evening Post covers. But like any artist, you have a deadline. And if you look to the deadline and you look to the, uh, you know, to the image on the left here, you'll see up on the right hand corner, you see this little red that catches your eye, uh, a, a document that says due date. So it's, it's, you know, he created this self-portrait of himself because he was at a loss for ideas, which I doubt he ever was, but he stared, he's staring at this blank canvas, what to do, what to do. Um, but it's, it's more that meets, it's really then again, look at the details, it's more that meets the eye. Um, it wasn't the deadlines that was so important, but it was the challenges of parenting because by this time, 1936, he was married and he had three sons and the three sons would run around the studio making the studio a mess. And he would very often tell his wife to you know, keep the kids out of the studio. And the wife's example was turn this into a learning lesson and you put up cards telling the kids what they can and they cannot touch. And so, What's wrong, you know, what's wrong with the scene, you know, again, looking to the details here, if you look down at the lower left in the palette, well, what, you know, what is in the paint? 
not the brush, you know, not the actual brush itself, but the handle of the brush. Um, you look at where his sketches are. He should be looking at his sketches, but the sketches are underneath his feet, so he can't refer to anything. And then there's a there's an empty matchbook that's uh, on the floor behind that has the mall stick. And if you see what a mall stick is, if you look underneath the chair there, the mall stick is it has a, like a, a pad at one end, and artists would use that to secure or keep their hands steady as they paint. So the mall stick is a very, a very important aspect for making detail. So your hand doesn't shake as you're creating fine line you know, after your painting there as well. So, you know, this, this not only is a great painting, but it was also for him, it was a teaching moment uh, himself. Like, you know, as, as he, his career grew on, he was often asked, well, how do you create, how do you create your scenes or how do you make a picture? And so in, there was in the 1940s, there was an article based on his reminiscence uh, and, and how he created a picture. He never, he never referred to his, uh, his images as illustrations or paintings. He always called them pictures and his process his process is itemized from left to right. And so the, the part of the process on the left is brainstorming. How, does, how do I get an idea? How do I think of an idea? Well, he starts out with a rough pencil sketch, then he casts his model. And when he casts his model, he creates the model, he gives him a costume, he asks his model to create all of these facial features, he coaxes them to create the facial features. and. But then when he does that, he creates a series of photographs. Um, and, you know, as you see, as you will see, photograph of photography played a very essential element, and particularly starting in the, in the late 20s and the 30s in the process of his painting because they helped him gain the pose. And you'll see this as we go on. So he snaps these photos um, and then he creates, he goes on to create a completely detailed charcoal sketch. And then he paints a colored sketch in the exact, uh, the exact size that is needed for the, for the, um, as, as for the reproduction, uh, the size of the poster covers, and then he creates the final, the final image, as you see down on the lower right and the lower portion of the painting. So when he, if and you know, I always find very interesting is that if you look in the on the right hand, the on the top and the right hand, you know, portion there, you see Rockwell creating the pose for his his uh, models, and because he would then he would he would then create the image of what he saw in his mind and how he wanted his models to you know to stand or to you know make with their facial features so think of this as we continue to look well <clears throat> the rockwell family moved from uh uh um New Rochelle. They moved up to Arlington, Vermont in 1938 and 1939. He bought an old farmhouse there. He wanted to get away from the city, even though he said he you know, wasn't a, a country boy, but he needed to get away from the, the energy, all of the energy there as well. So he bought an old farmhouse in Arlington, Vermont, which is a very, very tiny town. Um, and he he was able to get this, he was able to restart his artwork um, there. Um, and he, you know, brought his three his three sons who were getting into their late teens and and, and going off to uh, going off to school there. And what's said about him is is that and all his neighbors was the farmers and and uh, you know all of uh, the agricultural workers and then the townspeople, the local townspeople. He became they too became models for him as uh, his 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 neighbors in New Rochelle did. But he was it said that he was you know, even though he lived in the country, he was very fastidious and he would go out, you know, he'd be going out and, you know, drawing, uh, you know, drawing various things, but, you know, he was in beautiful, beautiful landscape. I mean, it was really lovely in this part of Vermont there, but he would go out and he'd say, well, I'm really glad I don't have to paint the landscape because I'm not a landscape painter, you know, but again, he used, he used all of the, the characters that he found. The image on the right is the, the home that they lived in um, until uh, 1953. So they lived there from 1939 to 1953. His studio is in the back. That's not the original studio. The studio burnt down, as, as you'll see. Um, and uh, uh, the 
uh, the home in the, uh, the past, I, I would say maybe 20, 25 years became a bed and breakfast. And most recently was for sale about three years ago. So again, it's in a very isolated area, but very close to the village of, of uh, Arlington. And so now, as you know, as I mentioned, he, he was, uh, you know, again, he was in a, a, a period of flux or a period of change within his, his career, still producing, <clears throat> still producing magazine covers. Um, so in 1941, we're in the um, America, uh, Europe is at war and America is on the verge of war. Um, he created this cover called The Girl Reading the, the Saturday Evening Post. So it's an image within an image here uh, as well. So he sent this uh, uh, image to Walt Disney um, with a note that to Walt Disney, one of the lead artists, from an admirer, Norman Rockwell. And that image, this the original image, remained in Walt Disney's office for years. And then it went into the Disney archives. Um, and then now is finally in the museum. And so the demand for the, uh, you know, the demand for this cover was so great. And, you know, you can see the inscription down at the bottom there. The demand was so great that the Saturday Evening Post had to create a second, a second image of, a second printing of this as well. In 1941, in his address to Congress, President Franklin Roosevelt articulated in his uh, vision for a post-war world founded on four basic human freedoms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. And in 1942, <clears throat> Rockwell was working on a piece that was commissioned by the United States Army of you know, the, the Ordnance Department of a painting that was a machine gunner in need of ammunition. And he was working on this and he was working on a poster and you know the, the title was supposed to be, let's give him enough and on time. And they would, you know, it was distributed to, to that was gonna be distributed to various ordnance plants throughout the country. But he was getting stuck. He was really getting stuck there. And he says, this was so darned high blown. Somehow I just can, couldn't get my mind around it. And while, while he was thinking about it, he came by chance, he, he went to a town meeting in Arlington and one of the neighbors, one of his neighbors got up, spoke and voiced an unpopular view. And, and that night, it's, and Rockwell said this in his memoirs, that night he woke up with a realization that he could paint the freedoms best from the perspective of his own hometown and using the experiences of everyday simple scenes such as his own town meeting. And so this was then the impetus to paint his four freedoms. And so Rockwell made rough sketches. Um, he uh, you know, you know, proposed them to the, uh, uh, the Saturday Evening Post. Um, the, uh, he, he also proposed to give them to the government, but the ordinance department didn't have the resources to create another commission. So on the way back, from the meeting with the ordinance department or the, the representatives from the ordinance department, Rockwell stopped at, at the Curtis Publishing Company, which was now the publisher of the Saturday Evening Post and showed his sketches to the editors. And the editors immediately made plans to use the illustrations in the post. And then he was given to, a, a permission to interrupt his work so that he could, um, you know, he, could, he could then create this whole series here. So <clears throat> three years later, he said it was a job that should have been tackled by Michelangelo because it was a very laborious job. The paintings were a phenomenal success. After their publication, the Post received 25,000 requests for reprints. In May, 1943, representatives from the Post and the United States Department of the Treasury announced a joint campaign to sell war bonds and stamps. And they would send the four freedoms along with uh, cartoons and other illustrators on a national tour. Well, then this, you know, this also generated more interest. And so the, the tour went to 16 cities. The exhibition was visited more by more than a million people who purchased $133 million in war bonds and stamps that were sold in denominations of 25, 100, and $1,000. And each person, person who purchased a bond received a set of prints of the four paintings. And so each of the, the prints themselves were, you know, were imprinted with by war bonds. So it was a very, very powerful 
uh, you know, powerful series, the background of the series was very powerful. So let's just take a look, a very brief look at these, uh, you know, these images here. Well, the, the initial one, the freedom of speech, again, initiated by his, his going to a town meeting and someone standing up, um, you know, saying an opposing view of what was being said by the you know, the, by the populace within the meeting there. And if you take a look at the determination of the young man that's standing up and is looking, you know, this idea of, of the, the, the positive direction of his look there, while all of the folks are not chewing him down, they're all looking at him and giving him respect to, to his, his own opinion there as well. On the left one, the freedom of worship no matter what worship, no matter what denomination, everyone in this country had to worship in, uh, you know, in their own conscience and, and, and in their own desire without being, uh, you know, without being broken down. A freedom from want, who, which we see all the time and parodies all the time. Um, the Thanksgiving dinner, coming together as a family, grandma and grandpa serving the meal when all the members of the family are anxious and happy and glad to be there in celebration. Um, and then the freedom, the freedom from fear, um, a young child being um, tucked into bed uh, by their parents who are, you know, th this is the future and the, the child is going to bed. And the dad is holding in his hand a newspaper that you know talks about the bombings that are going on. So these the series themselves weren't you know were as much about contemporary events as and as more importantly about life after the war and and the and the fears that that would be abolished by you know by by the fighting within the war there as well. So. The uh, production again, you know, being produced as a foursome, looking at them as a foursome themselves. Um, as I mentioned in in, uh, in the spring of 1943, Rockwell's studio burnt down. Um, he recorded it in in again in a uh, his very uh, you know harmonious hysterical kind of way, um, where he talked all you know it's like a narrative, it's like a graphic na novel where he talks about how the, the studio burnt down and they had to get the fire department and had to call the fire department. And you think everything, you know, was going to, you know, going to rack and ruin. Unfortunately, when the studio burnt down, whatever was in the studio was lost. Um, however, the good part, he was working at the, on the freedom of worship at that time. And he had just shipped it off to the uh, publishers a few days before that. And so, uh, you know, it was at this point that he built a new studio in West Arlington uh, and continued his work. Um, so during the war <clears throat> and, and starting actually starting uh, in 1941, starting two months before World Harbor, uh, you know, the, the idea of war, they knew it was coming, um, but he started this, this, um, this series that became very, very popular and it was called the Willie, Gears, Willie Gillis Jr series. And it was a fictional young man called Willie Gillis. And, uh, and he, he created uh, 11 covers during 1941 to 1946. And it was uh, uh, a series of the life of Willie Gillis. And Willie Gillis, in, in, in this, first, this first particular one here, um, is Willie Gillis is this young guy from, you know, somewhere in the United States. And he hasn't achieved any, any military status and he hasn't achieved any fame, but here he goes. He's this freckled face, all American boy that is typifying the American soldier during, uh, you, know, you know, the American soldier, particularly in, um, as they knew by 1940, the European theater was escalating and uh, Americans were starting to enlist. So <clears throat> this name Willie Gillis um, came from his wife who suggested we Willie Winky, you know, use that as a basis. So Willie Gillis, you know, that's how the uh, the name came about. So <clears throat> Willie Gillis was quote an inoffensive, ordinary little guy thrown into the chaos of war. However, the public identified with the little little guy living up to the sense of duty during the war. But they're they're very you know they're very particular in their illustrations because he 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 caught the edge of them. So the model was a man called Robert Otis Buck 
and who was a sawmill hand in Arlington, Vermont. And he eventually enlisted into the Navy and he served in the South Seas during the war. And so in this first one here where Willie Gillis goes, uh, you know, Willie Gillis gets, receives a package from home. Um, you know, the package from home makes you a popular guy. And so this is the introduction to Willie Gillis. So there's food, no delay, you know, everybody, you know, once you get a package and once you got a package, everybody was surrounded around, around you to see what you were getting and if you were gonna share. And she's surrounded and he's outflanked by seven American servicemen that are all smiling, thinking about perhaps they're going to be, uh, you know, going to get something, you know, from the fate of the package. And two of the soldiers, uh, two of the servicemen outrank him uh, in position and, and you can see that. And then you get to the additional ones in the series. So home sweet home, <clears throat> home sweet home or on leave, Willie goes off to, to fight. And again, you see the uh, November 20. 1931, he goes off, but he's, he's home on leave. Um, and so he's home and he's in mom's house and under a log cabin quilt. And he, <clears throat> he is um, far from the activity. Uh, so this, uh, you know, again, is, is the returning to the comforts of home. On the right hand side is Willie, Willie is at the, at the USO. And he's, you know, being given all kinds, he's being catered to by two beautiful young women and uh, given cake and tea and they can't do anything more for him or, you know, they can't, there's nothing they can do for him. And here's this young innocent in, surrounded by, um, by these two women. Well, this is his first experience away from home. And so, you know, he's, he's, he's really being opened up into the ways of the world there. Then the, the hometown news, uh, 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 he's, it, it's where, Willie has been assigned K, K, uh, KP duty where he's peeling potatoes or peeling apples or whatever he is. And he gets the news from his mom or from, uh, from home. So he's got the local newspaper. And he's, he's um, you know, the, when, when Rockwell paint, uh, when created this image, you notice that there's no background image or there's no town uh, specifically listed because he wanted it to be worldwide. It could be any place in the United States. Um, so <clears throat> again, uh, the the, uh, on the on the image on the right is what to do in a blackout and what to do in a blackout. You know, there wasn't a blackout in the United States, but you know, the hat of uh, being worn um, by the character on the on the on the left there is the hat that was in the height of fashion during the early 40s there as well and would capture a GI's attention so it's fun and scary at the same time and then Willie Gillis in church um, so this is a bit more pensive where he's sitting in in a pews that you know the the it's not tremendously crowded um, there's another service person in the in the pew there itself um, but he has a very different look on his face because it's one of contemplation. And the contemplation is what lies ahead is not all fun and adventure. So that, that you know, that spunkiness is not being portrayed in this image. Um, so the way that Rockwell portrayed this image is that the white space around him creates a solitary image. He's alone. Um, and, and to refer to the fact that a soldier was alone uh, when he goes off to war, alone in his feeling and alone in his mood. It's a very serious space. And it also shows that he's aged a bit. Willie has aged a bit there as well. As well. And, and you know, due to his uh, service experience, he's also gained muscles. <clears throat> The one on the right, Double Trouble for Willie Gillis, um, where he is uh, surrounded again by, uh, you know, with, with uh, images of, uh, um, you know, the, the daughters of uh, a, a, another friend of his. But again, this, this idea of, of um, you know, thinking about, uh, um, uh, you know, love. And then Willie Travels, the cat, 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 cat's cradle. Um, he, <clears throat> he's, showing, he's showing a, uh, a snake charmer who's charming the snake. Well, he's showing uh, a, a rope trick to the, the cha snake charmer who's astonished in his, his what the small town boy can do. Um, and he can charm himself. On the right-hand side, New Year's Eve, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the images that surround his sweetheart surround the bed. 
uh, and the various in the various aspects there. Willie Gillis's family heritage, uh, the family heritage there is all the fighting Gillises going back in his ancestry, going back to the American Revolution. So again, that sense of honor and duty uh, to the you know the local American GI. And then in the last one, Willie Gillis goes off to college while the war is over. 1946, Willie Gillis comes home. He gets the GI Bill, and then he <clears throat> he uh, he goes off and he starts to study. And so again, this is a it's a process for him um, where he you can see on the top of the image there his army hat and and you know the the items from his war service. But now he's in the next the next aspect of his life. And Rosie the Riveter was a very popular 1940 song that uh, was recorded in 1942 by uh, the big band, the big bands, Kay Kaiser. And uh, it was inspired by the American women who went off to work as the American men went off to fight. And by, <clears throat> and the song became called like by the American women, they began to work in factories during the war, and it became, uh, you know, symbols for American uh, women empowerment. And so as a result of the uh, Rosie the Riveter, the song and the women going off, uh, you know, the images of women, um, you know, working in the factory, 11 million women began to volunteer for uh, line work in munitions factories. And so between 1940 and 1945, the females in the workforce uh, averaged about 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so one out of every four married women worked outside the home. And so there was a government campaign to recruit women, female workers, for the munitions factory. So this song, Rosie the Riveter, became uh, very, very popular where Rosie was a tireless assembly line worker who, who, who earned a production E during her, during her part for the war effort. Well, in uh, uh, the poster, We Can Do It, J. Howard Miller out of Pittsburgh, um, was hired by Westinghouse to create a series of posters for the war effort, particularly for Westinghouse based out of, of Pittsburgh. And um, it, this also later uh, uh, became known as a Rosie the Riveter female there. Um, and so the model for this was found to be a woman named Naomi Parker, who actually worked at the Alameda Navy Air Force Station in California. The poster itself was displayed only to Westinghouse uh, employees in February 1943, and then disappeared for 40 years. And so the goal of the poster in the, in the 40s, 1943, was not to recruit women, but to motivate propaganda for both of the sexes already employed at Westinghouse. And again, I mentioned it was rediscovered 40 years later in the 1980s, and it became associated and famous, uh, you know, famous with this association of the femis, feminist movement, but was mistakenly referred to as Rosie the Riveter. However, um, Norman Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter was a bit different. It was it was based in it was in 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 Arlington, uh, Vermont. He uh, had his model. Her name was Mary Doyle Keith. She was nineteen. Um, she was a phone operator in the town, and she was asked by Norman Rockwell to pose for this image that he was going to create for Saturday Evening Post. She posed twice in a white blouse and shoes, but it wasn't what he was looking for. Well, Mary Doyle Keefe was 110 pounds, very, very tiny. And what he did is he transformed this young 19 year old into a very, um, very well, you know, well built uh, woman. And um, in the pose and in the original pose here, you could see where he based on a Michelangelo, one of the, the sibyls from the Sistine ceiling. He, he, had, he had her holding a ham sandwich and he did have her with a white hanky in her pocket and he had a rivet gun and he actually had the gun that was lightweight, but it was a fake. And, um, and he, you see that uh, what she's standing on is a copy of Mein Kampf. And, but he didn't, you know, she never did see Mein Kampf itself. So Rockwell portrayed uh, Rosie as a monumental figure clad in overalls and a work short shirt as part of the workforce of women that came to the aid of the American munitions factories. And so the, <clears throat> the sleeves are rolled up, so displaying very muscular arms. 
um, who pauses for lunch. Uh, the American flag is a backdrop, the, the, the waving flag and the backdrop there. Um, but he's also portrayed her, you know, as, as this muscular person, but he also portrays her with lipstick and nail polish. So that also shows you the feminine side uh, with her as well. Um, <clears throat> Mary was uh, actually met, Mrs. Mrs. Rockwell had met Mary when she went to pay her telephone bill and, uh, you know, suggested that her husband used her as a model in one of her paintings there as well. And so all of these uh, images, uh, you know, portrayed, he, he did photographic images or references to these as well, but they were all destroyed in his studio fire. Um, so um, Mary never saw the completed painting. She only saw the painting in a Saturday evening post when it was portrayed on, uh, when it was in the newsstand. So she never saw that as well. So the original, uh, of the image was after the war was seen less and less. Uh, the copyright uh, was, you know, part of an estate. And in 2002, the painting was sold at Sotheby's for five million dollars. And this painting, the original of this painting, is in the Crystal Bridges Museum in uh, in um, Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, from an anonymous donor. donor. So some more images from the war. Uh, tattoo artist, um, you know, again, another local fellow was Mead Schaefer um, with his disheveled, uh, you know, disheveled hair and soiled pants. And he sat for him, uh, you know, he sat for him. And what was very funny about this, if you take a look at, at uh, the, um, uh, the, the young man sitting getting his tattoos and you look what's being tattooed on his arm, is all the names of his girlfriends. And every time he, you know, went on to a different girl, the tattoo artist had to cross out the old name and put in a new one. Um, and then war stories. And in war stories, here you have a, uh, a, a, an older fellow who has a son that's, uh, that's fighting. Um, and he's listening to the uh, reports and the, um, you know, he's listening to the reports in, on, the, um, on the radio and he's following along with that with them as well. Um, so, you know, he has, he has his son serving. It's, it, the listening is more than a pastime because he's also charting the, uh, the battles, um, you know, the battles that are going along. And so uh, on, the, on the background wall, he has the photographs of his son uh, and, and as well there as well. Um, at the end of the war, uh, you know, the, the, the hasten the homecoming, you know, is always the big the big influence of, of buying war bonds and helping out the American cause. And um, so the uh, hasten the homecoming, the American soldier comes home to not a very uh, uh, you know like a, an ostentatious kind of home, but to an everyday uh, perhaps city environment where you know the youngster comes home and his family can't wait to meet him. And then on the, the home for Thanksgiving. Um, if you look at the bottom right, you see the original uh, photograph that he, he himself set up uh, of uh, a mother and son who were his, his neighbors. Um, the, uh, the young man went off and he became part of the Air Corps and, and flew 65 missions. Um, but the father was the milkman. They, they were the, ne the neighboring farm here as well. Um, and then war stories, you know, around the, the potbelly stove uh, in, in Arlington, so, you know, the, young, the youngster comes home and he, he talks about his stories, you know, holding a Japanese flag that perhaps he captured in one way or another. And everybody is, is listening to the stories, as well as the young, perhaps the young brother that, you know, who's looking at his brother as a hero. On the right-hand side, this the Navy, uh, the, the the Navy um, recruit there is now home at last, and he's relaxing in the backyard with his puppy on the on his uh, you know on his lap, and he's having a well-deserved rest there. Um, April Fool, <clears throat> he produced a series of of three magazine covers um, that was initially was initially going to be one, and they became very popular. Um, and he, he did them in two year sequences. And each of the magazine covers, is, again, you have to look to the detail because if each of them were the April Fool's issue, but each of them are beyond what you see. So in the first hand one, um, the, the older couple are playing chess and <clears throat> you can see, I'll give you some examples of what you can see that the coffee spout is upside down. Um, the there's barbed wire instead of uh, oh, no, sorry, <clears throat> sorry. 
the the uh, the trout and the fish hook are supposed to be in the water, but they're sitting on the rug. Uh, there's a mailbox. There's a faucet. Uh, the wallpaper has two different designs. If you looked at the left and the right, the scissors are the candlestick. If you look on the mantelpiece there as well, bacon and eggs are on the decorative plate on the wall. Um, you know, there's an April Fool's clock there. You know, just all these little funny little sequences that were produced so that, you know, when you bought the magazine, it was really like an I spy type of thing. In the center one, <clears throat> the center one um, where the guy, again, it, it looks like he's going fishing there. Um, but there's apples on a maple tree. Uh, there's very diff different color apples. There's a baseball with the apples. Um, the, there's uh, grapes. Um, if, if you look at the date, April 1st was on a Sunday not that year, not a Monday. Uh, there's different color eggs, you know, and on and on. And then the, and the very right-hand side one where the young girl goes into uh, a, a store uh, with her doll. You see various other images where like the electric bulb is growing on a plant. There's a pen hold with an eraser. Um, there's a face on the clock, you know, very, very much things, but it was his sense of humor. And it was a way to, you know, some serious situations. And it was also a way to give the American people something, you know, fun to do, you know, on, 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 uh, by looking at a magazine cover. And post-war, <clears throat> Again, there was this change in, you know, the, the young soldiers were coming home, they were having families and, you know, there was, again, this, this change in, in uh, some of the, the, the focus points of the uh, magazine covers themselves. And so the babysitter, young, young kid is supposed to be sitting and watching the baby. So all her school books are abandoned um, and she's focusing in on how to, how to basically shut the kid up. Um, and the, with the teddy bear and the rattle, which are on the floor. Um, and again, you know, with, with uh, Rockwell's attention to detail, um, the chintz, you know, he uses not a plain, plain seat cover, but he uses chintz on a slip cover. He uses an, a, an elaborate wallpaper design. The cola bottle um, on the left there um, is partial view. The book, you have the title of the book. On the right-hand side, the great debate, well, mom and dad, young family, you know, are arguing over the breakfast table. Um, and his, you can obviously tell that his opinion is more important than hers. Um, they, in this particular uh, case, they're arguing about the candidates for the election. Um, the wife is sitting there sulking because she's convinced her candidate should be Harry Truman at this point. And the husband is, is uh, arguing that his candidate should be Thomas Dewey. Um, there's an overturned glass on the table. The child is sitting on the floor crying. Um, so again, you know, that's it, how their, their issues, uh, you know, are, are being worked out in the course of a visual narrative. Going and coming <clears throat> is, a, is an image that is en route to a family trip to the lake. And again, uh, uh, Rockwell was still living in Arlington, Vermont. Um, and so it is a story of contentment where <clears throat> the, the family is going off to vacation with all these high hopes and great time and the kids are looking forward, the dog is going along, everything is, is really, you know, it's, it's really as a family vacation should be. And they're driving their only family car, which is an old jalopy. They have the rowboat up on the top there, uh, mom, dad, grandma, <clears throat> the kids and the dog. Um, so, you know, the folding chairs are tacked along the side. Well, a week or so later, they're coming home exhausted. They have great memories. Um, but you could see the process through how he created this image by taking photos. And again, as you saw in the process earlier, by taking photos of various aspects of the composition and then creating almost like a storyboard from which he would create the, the finalized sketch. Um, Rockwell had dogs and he loved his dogs and he used them as models in several of the paintings. Well, in 1948, um, <clears throat> one, of, one of Rockwell's neighbors in, um, in Arlington uh, started passing around this very bad uh, kind of a, a, a rumor. And <clears throat> it was about him and he wanted to get his revenge. And so he, he, crea <laughs> he created this image that was called the gossips. And um, he spottled, he spottled um, you know, he used much of the adult population of the village itself. And he started to worry that the, that the image 
would offend his neighbors. So he included himself and his wife. Um, so it, it's down towards the bottom there as well. But you could see, you know, it's like playing telephone. Someone tells someone who turns around and tells someone else who turns around and tells someone else. You know, it's, it's just a, a vignette of, human, uh, of the human condition there as well. And on the left, you can see his photo images and how, again, how he, again, started to transpire, uh, you know, the, the composition for this. For this particular image. Um, in the 1950s, um, he, uh, um, you know, is focusing on the American family, uh, you know, very particularly post-war. And in this particular image on the left, it's called Walking to Church. Um, he based this image on uh, one of Vermeer's painting um, from Delft in the 1650s. It's one of the exteriors that Vermeer did. He admired Vermeer as far as the quietness of his interiors and exteriors. And so he kind of more or less paralleled uh, the image of, you know, the, the country town and the, the family going off uh, to, to church there as well. And so, uh, so he said at this point, I couldn't paint it better than Vermeer. Vermeer, so I painted it bigger. So it, it's, it takes place in a quiet, uh, in a quiet Sunday in an American city. The sun, the the family is in their sun best. They walk to church before all the neighbors get up. So it's a quiet street. Um, the church bells are ringing. The birds are in flight above. You know, so it's a, it's again, it tells you that the it's a quiet. Uh, you know, it's a quiet street scene where he himself grew up in Manhattan. You know, this is transpiring it into a quiet quiet little village sound here as well. And in 2013, this painting um, sold to uh, sold at Sotheby's for $3.2 million. Um, and it uh, was, uh, you know, was the reason it was sold is that the owner couldn't afford the insurance on the on the painting as well. Staying Grace um, takes place in, in 1951. Uh, it was a 1951 cover. And at, um, um, it is actually took place in a real diner uh, where an older woman and a child come in and, and uh, to the diner. And before they actually have their meal, they bow their heads and um, they, they say grace. And the young men share the table, but they are honoring her with the respect uh, as is the man on the left. They're honoring the respect of the, the woman uh, saying grace. They're curious, but they honor her. They don't interrupt her. Um, they don't have any contemptuous looks on her face, but they're, they're caught in the view, uh, um, you know, they're caught in the view of the image there as well. When this painting was, or this image was, uh, Put out in 1951, it was the, the in the aspect of the post-war quote affirmation of the need for religious faith in an increasingly godless society. Um, but it has since been, you know, it was it, at that point in time it was it was dismissed as sentimental kish. But it's, it was a snapshot of uh, you know of of America post-war and giving thanks. Um, but you know, Rockwell himself said he wasn't a churchgoer, but he wanted to create a series or a group of people. I and mean, you can see it was an industrial town that were, they were jumbled together and they came from diverse backgrounds, but then they coexisted peacefully. Um, so, you know, he, he achieved that, um, you know, he achieved that, uh, you know, through the image. But now the interesting thing about this is that in, in 1955, um, and this painting was done in 1951, Saving Grace was voted the most popular uh, of the Saturday Evening Post covers. Um, and because of the choice of setting and the objects were very essential to the theme and the message uh, as well, because, you know, it was, it was about, and, and again, mid fifties, what is America and what are we thinking? Because it, it was drawing them back to a simpler, uh, simpler part uh, of life. The second interesting part about this is that George Lucas bought this painting in 19, uh, 2013 um, and uh, to the tune of $46 million. And it was at a point in time, it still holds the record for being the most expensive Rockwell painting sold at auction. Uh, all right, 
so again, documenting, documenting American life. By 1953, um, the Rockwells moved from, uh, from Arlington, Vermont. They moved to Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And Stockbridge, Massachusetts is a lovely Berkshire town. It's a, you know, it's a quintessential Berkshire, Berkshire town there as well. And so as part of, again, part of, of this continuation of documenting American life post-war, um, it was talking about family life and, and all of these wonderful things you know, honoring uh, the American families. Um, so <clears throat> in Stockbridge, the again, using local models, um, marriage license takes place in, uh, you know, in where the couple comes to the, the law office and um, they want to take out a marriage license in a very young, very naive couple. And so as his models, and it's a very, you know, the, the image itself is very, very detailed because you get the whole flavor and sense of the office itself. But the model there um, <clears throat> is uh, the model for the town clerk is was the town clerk himself, Jason Bauman. And he was he was um, asked Bauman to be the model because he had just lost his wife and he was mourning his wife. And so he thought that, you know, by asking uh, the former town clerk Bauman to, to serve as his model to help him lift himself out of mourning as well. And so it, and it did, and, you know, he became like the star of the town. And so in this dark old municipal office, the young couple, comes in, the young woman has a sunny dress and she, you know, they, which is, you know, they go into marriage again, a little of a burning young, happy future, um, you know, surrounded by all of these emblems of, of like the older times. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's just, a, it's a very happy thing. And again, you look to the details, a sweet little kitten down below the chair, a spittoon and, you know, a cigarette you know, it's being used for cigarettes and all, of, and all of that, you know, and on the right-hand side, happy birthday, Miss Jones. And uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, Norman Rockwell's elementary teacher was Miss Jones, or as a Miss Jones. Um, he wasn't a strong student, but Miss Jones regularly encouraged him to draw. And so he it it created this image to thank Miss Jones, even though, you know, that she had passed away by then. Um, and so what he's showing is that Miss Jones is coming into this, her classroom, and the kids want to make a happy, uh, you know, a happy time for her. And so they, you know, they're, they're acting on their best behavior. One of the kids or a couple of the kids wrote happy birthday all over the board. And, um, you know, they, they created a, 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 you know, very happy scene. Well, as the result of this image, uh, it, became very, very popular, particularly with teachers and used in, in hundreds of letters from teachers in, in similar scenarios. So it served as a model for things to come. Um, this this uh, image here, it's called Girl in the Mirror, a girl and the mirror. It's a young child who's looking in the mirror. She's at the verge of adolescence. And, you know, she's, you can, you know, she's looking at herself and image, imagining herself, is she pretty? Um, what am I going to look like? And you can see where she's growing out of her childhood, where her baby doll is thrown off on the, on the ground there. And she's more concerned about her looks and taking care of herself. Um, the child that modeled for this was uh, uh, a woman, a young woman called Mary Wellen. She was in fifth grade at the time. She wasn't interested in growing up. She was a tomboy. Um, so he wanted to portray this idea. And he, he said to her, um, you know, there's this forgotten doll there. You've tossed away your doll. You, you no longer play with the doll. Um, you, you know, you're wondering about what a young, beautiful woman you'll grow up to uh, to, to, you'll grow up to be. And she has this magazine on her lap, which is uh, opened up to Jane Russell, who was a popular actress at that time. Um, so the critics, you know, lambasted this at one point and saying, you know, do all, do all kids think they can grow up and become movie star? Well, at this point in time, that was very prevalent there as well. But again, he's portraying the poignancy uh, and the uncertainty of growing up. Um, this, uh, the art critic done in 19, 55, uh, it uses his son Jarvis, uh, which is one of his sons who actually did become an artist. Um, and he, he's portraying his 
uh, the young artist coming into the museum and examining, examining images. And as he's examining the image, and here you see Rockwell's humor, all of the images are looking back at him. And so he's blurring the line between fantasy and reality. And so, you know, he, he's, he's uh, you know, again, you, you see where he started with a model and then he portrayed the model in various, in various facial attributes until he finally got to the right one where a very serious Jarvis is looking at the model who's, you know, humor, humorously looking back at him, you know, perhaps a little seductively as well. Um, so there is a, you know, there's dollops of paint on the palette. Um, so, you know, that includes us in the, in the drawing as well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty humorous type of image there as well. The safe haven runaway, um, again, based on, you know, based on photographic representation, the child is about to run away. He's got his little tied up uh, hobo thing, his, his possessions are on the floor. Um, but yet he's surrounded by a very protective and understanding uh, police officer. It's in a pristine setting of a local diner, very clean, everything shines. And the kid wants to run away and become a hobo. And so this one is, uh, you know, this, this poster after it was, re after it was uh, pr produced for the Saturday Evening Post in 1958, copies of this cover then started to grace walls of, of police stations and diners across the, uh, across the United States. And the actual location of the diner was a Howard Johnson's restaurant in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is uh, actually where the Berkshire Museum is and wasn't too far from Stockbridge, Massachusetts as well. So what, what um, uh, Rockwell did as he created the image is he removed all aspects of the uh, Howard Johnson's, you know, the co commercializations of that. So then it would take on this anonymous diner scene uh, anywhere throughout the United States. The Shiner, is a uh, boy usually have shiner and here you have this little tomboy tomboy here um and she's very proud of the fact that she had a fight and she got a shiner out of him, but then she was also referred to the principal's office and and she was the victor but you know you have this great smile on her face um so he's working on this and he you know he's working with the model and he didn't have anybody with a uh, a shiner. So he went to the local hospital and didn't find anyone with the shiner. And then he he ran a mo he ran an ad in the local newspaper there for a model with a black eye. And the news got all, out. And offers of models came from around the uh, around the around the country. And so the uh, um, this gentleman in within the local town uh, had fallen down the stairs and had two black eyes. And he, his father, uh, you know, the, he, he, he served as the model for the black eye, the actual black eye itself. Um, in 1960, he was, Rockwell was commissioned by uh, Saturday Evening Post to create portraits of the presidential candidates. Um, Senator JFK was, uh, was, uh, uh, produced on October 29th, 1960, and Vice President Richard Nixon on November 5th. When Kennedy uh, won the presidential election, he was then asked to produce uh, 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 an image of the First Lady in a reflective mood. Um, Rockwell used uh, the image, the same image of uh, Kennedy uh, one other time, and uh, when, when Kennedy was assassinated uh, in 1963. What's interesting, we just go back here, what's interesting about this is Jacqueline Kennedy, because in uh, 1968, um, Rockwell, Rockwell had a gallery show, and among the visitors to the gallery show was Andy Warhol. And Andy Warhol was one of the first prominent contemporary artists to recognize Rockwell's merit. And he attended the show and he bought two works, and one of them was a portrait of uh, Jackie Kennedy, and he uh, and if you know um, uh, Andy Warhol, he went on to produce a series of serographs of silk screen prints of Jackie Warhol before and after Kennedy's assassination. And he, uh, you know, he he they talked about he talked about that Rockwell was, um, uh, you know, was an inspiration for him because of his portrayal. Of, of, you know, of, of, of Jackie Oness, of Jackie Kennedy, but also the way he portrayed the American people. And he, he you know, the, the, the image was, uh, and what it's looked at, and it was looked at in that particular time, uh, it, 
the critic says, in some ways, Norman Rockwell is to American painting what Warhol was to contemporary art at that time. So, you know, it had a very close assimilation. Um, in 1961, um, you know, in the 1960s, uh, Rockwell started to uh, concentrate on social issues and, and, you know, very contemporary issues there as well. And he was serious subjects. He was looking at serious subjects. And in the 1960s, there was growing concerns about the nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. And he looked for a way to, for his, to him to make a contribution very similar to the four freedoms during the 1940s. And so he, he, had, uh, he was working on a mural for uh, a United, the United Nation. And, and that mural became one of the inspirations for him. So he, is, he took the idea of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so he began, you know, it began as a drawing. The work began as a drawing, inspired, inspired by the United Nations hum, humanitarian mission that was conceived in 1952. And, um, and he, he worked with 65 models, so 65 people that represented the world's population uh, and the, the world's nation. And so um, he then created, the idea was then to express hope with uh, the new peacekeeping organization of the United Nations. He did, ex Rockwell did extensive research, photo, you know, photo displays and models. Um, and then uh, he, you know, he, he combined them all together within the, uh, within the, the piece itself. But he became, you know, he became very uh, he disparaged with, the, with the, the way the image was going. So, uh, you know, that was in the 1950s. He picked this up again in, in 1960 and he re-envisioned that and he created the image that you see before you. Um, and he focused on the idea, I'm focusing on the idea of a common humanity. Um, in 1985, the, uh, the, uh, the, the original image was reimagined as a mosaic, and it was gifted to the United Nations by Nancy Reagan, and which is still is in the United Nations headquarters. In Peace Corps, 1966, JFK, uh, the image is called the Peace Corps, JFK's Bold, Bold, Bold Legacy, um, was done for Look magazine. And um, it was a repeat of this, you know, like the freedom of worship of one of the four freedoms, which led to the impact of this particular image, because he chose to portray faces and feelings and, you know, the, through, the, through the young faces themselves, that they would commemorate the fifth anniversary of the Peace Corps. If you notice at the top of the, the image, you see JFK, you see all of these young adults here looking towards the future and looking towards bettering humanity. Um, and during uh, JFK's campaign in the 1960s, he proposed the idea of a volunteer organization of people that are sent to developing countries, and in those days it was Africa and Asia, to assist in education and agricultural projects. It was officially installed in, in 1961. And in, um, in this image, um, the models and paintings, um, he, he, uh, you know, he, he more or less was able to, uh, uh, you know, to work with, with actual young people, but also work with, um, you know, he, he, he talked about the fact about beautiful young faces because, and, and referred to Bruegel, who was a, a, a 17th century uh, Netherlands artist, because Bruegel painted each tree as an individual. So every, every single person had an individual characteristic. The problem we all live with here was done in response uh, to, Ru to Ruby Bridges on her way to the, uh, William France Elementary School. And again, you know, Rockwell was focusing on social imagery and social problems here as well. And it was an, a, became the iconic image of the civil rights movement. Um, Ruby Bridges um, was six, was on her way to school. Um, and it uh, was during the New, or New Orleans desegregation crisis um, because of threats and violence. She was accompanied by four U.S. Deputy Marshals, um, which their heads are cropped out, so their identities are cropped out. On the wall, the racial slur nigger, nigger and KKK, as well as the smashed tomato, uh, is there. And the scene is being viewed from a, 
uh, from the front, you know, so we're viewing the, the image as we would see it uh, there as well. This image was originally part of the centerfold of 1964's Look magazine. Um, at this point in time, uh, in the middle 60s, uh, Rockwell severed his um, his association with Saturday Evening Post because they wouldn't allow him to portray political scenes. And so then he, he signed on to Look Magazine. He, Look offered him a forum for his, for his social images, his social interests. And, and, and particularly at this time, it was civil rights and integration. So uh, this image places a young Ruby as the sole proprietor, the sole image uh, that we should be looking at um, because it uses a, a, a you know a light and dark combination of color. She stands out, um, you know, more so than anything else in the painting there as well. In uh, July to October 2011, President Obama install, installed this painting outside of the Oval Office um, because um, he said, uh, or an art historian said, the N word there it sure stops you. Um, so it was that realistic reason having the graffiti as a slur um, you know so one of the concerns at that point in time is that the painting couldn't be hung in a public space particularly at the white house but president obama you know broke all of those those records there as well new kids in the neighborhood 1967 um the uh it's it's uh you know it's during the period of time where um, Negroes started, Black Americans started moving out to the suburbs, but it's being portrayed through the eyes of children. Um, five kids, two Blacks and, and three white children are staring at each other. They're forced to stare at each other because they're curious. And so uh, the, you know, the boy has a, a, a baseball glove, the girl has a little kitten in her hand. Um, and uh, you know the the same boys they're paralleled by the boy in the baseball uniform and the young girl with the pink bows in her hands and you see the the this idea of the tension that's drawn to you know be, that's drawn to between the two groups of children um, because the empty space them eyeing each other and again you see there the models that he used in the bottom um, the triple self portrait. Um, I'm, I'm running a little bit over. Anyway, the triple self, self portrait, I'm almost done, is one that he did in 1960. And it's a pretty, pretty, you know, pretty captured, captures pretty well the essential, the essential aspects of his character. He was asked to do a self portrait to announce the first of eight of the eight expert excerpts of his autobiography. And so as a result, it, he created this very lighthearted, self-deprecating um, you know, portrait. Um, he was a stickler for neatness, and yet he's got everything thrown on the studio floor. And, and, and you know, everything looks like it's about to fall over. If you look at the book on the, on the, you know, the little bench with, that holds the mirror there, the Coca-Cola bottle, uh, Coca-Cola cup is about to fall off the chair. Um, the brass in the brass bucket down at the bottom, he threw a cigarette butt and it's start, about to start a fire. The helmet on the top is usually, uh, you know, was usually used on an un, is a prop, it was used on an unused uh, 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 easel, but it came from a, a visit to Paris that he made in the, in the 1920s. And on the right hand side, you see four self portraits, Durer, Rembrandt, Picasso, and Van Gogh. And he, he, you know, he used those as his models. I mean, they were, they were there in the background for him. The connoisseur um, is an image that, you know, many times during his career, Rockwell said, I am not a modern artist. I don't particularly care for modern art, but it's art. And so he, he uh, created uh, this composition about a conventional, conventional uh, say art critic um, with the, the suit and the umbrella and the hat looking at a drip painting, you know, on the style of a Jackson Pollock there as well. You know, and, and again, Rockwell always said he wasn't a modern artist. He was fascinated by it, appreciated it, um, you know, but it wasn't his thing. By placing the connoisseur with his back to us, it leaves us as, uh, you know, leaves us, the viewer, uh, a, a chance to interpret as we should, as a, a narrative painting there as well. So, um, Christmas Day, uh, he, he always thought of Christmas Day and he was very, very fond of Christmas, but he always said Christmas Day was on uh, December 26th um, because, uh, you know, when Rockwell was in his, uh, in his prime and as he had children, um, he would 
they would visit Uncle Gil on the um, on the 26th, and that was when all the ce celebrations used to take place. So we'd visit, you know, we'd visit, uh, you know, the family would get together and visit in Stockbridge. So so Christmas was a very special occasion, and so. Christmas also as a holiday and for the Saturday evening post um, was very popular, you know, the portrayal of Santa Claus and Pop Frederick was very often the model for the Christmas, the image uh, for Santa Claus and the image on the right uh, is is a hysterical image because here you have this young child who believes in Santa Claus but now he's questioning because he opens up the bottom drawer and what pull, what he pulls out is a Santa uniform. Um, Stockbridge, Massachusetts is the quintessential uh, town uh, where he moved to in, uh, uh, in the mid 1950s and he lived there until 1978. And so there's the, uh, the, the the scene there up in the very top, it's called Main Street Stockbridge. And Main Street Stockbridge is a, a compendium of buildings. And I'll just explain to you very quickly. In the center of the image, you see um, a building with a picture window and a Christmas tree in the center. Well, originally, originally that was, that was uh, when he moved to Stockbridge, that was the original location for Rockwell Studio, who then created another studio between behind, um, the Stockbridge Inn, which is the big inn on the right hand side. So here you have all of these, uh, you know, little town shops, very wide main street there, but all of these town shops that are more or less lit up for the holidays that are surrounded by the Berkshire Mountains. The town exactly looks today as it did in, in uh, 1967, it's retained that image. When uh, in this painting, uh, this painting is on permanent display in the Norman Rockwell Museum. And when you go to the museum, very often you have a docent that was either a child or was used as a as a, a model in in some of the uh, you know some of the earlier paintings, and they very often tell the stories, very personal stories about growing up in Stockbridge and having uh, you know having the uh, rock being in a Rockwell painting. This painting took a long time to complete, but what you also notice that in the center of the painting is 1950s car. On, on the right hand side, particularly, and on the left, you have 1960s car. So you know it's this timeless quality itself uh, that is is uh, being portrayed. So again, it's this quintessential holiday image. Um, Rockwell lived in Stockbridge for the last 25 years of his life. He saw it as the quote the best in New England, the best in America, and um, you know in in uh, you know he he. Uh, every every year, starting in the beginning of December, in honor of Rockwell's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, course in, in the town there, they create and they decorate, uh, you know, the the town to look very much like this image itself. I mentioned earlier that Rockwell was always viewed as an, uh, you know, as an illustrator. He he made pictures. He always created these pictures. Well, in 2001 to 2002, there was this great retrospective exhibition in the Guggenheim. And, um, and the Guggenheim is on, uh, in, in New York City. And the, the museum walls were filled with all of the Saturday Evening Post covers. And it was at this juncture in time in 2000, you know, about 20 years after his death, that the leap was made from illust illustrator to fine art because of the show in the Guggenheim itself. Um, so if in, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the, the um, museum, uh, the, it's a new museum and it has all of Rockwell's, uh, you know, as many as they can of original paintings, but also the, all of the magazine covers downstairs. They relocated the studio from the town center of Stockbridge to the grounds of, of the Stockbridge Museum. Um, in the interior of the studio, they set up uh, him working on the Golden Rule. Um, so they set up as the studio would have looked, um, but uh, oh, let me just go forward here. Uh, but just in closing, Rockwell said, I believe strongly that a painting should communicate something to large numbers of people. So according to some critics, my work is old fashioned, trite, banal. This criticism worries me down and then, especially when a picture I'm trying to finish is going badly. But I learned I can't change. I'm not a modern artist and never will be. I don't see things the, the way modernists do, even though I enjoy their work. I've been an illustrator since I was 16 years old. I'm not particularly satisfied with my work, but I'm always trying to improve it. 
And he, he, he goes on to say um, in 1960 that the view of life I communicate in my pictures excludes the sordid and the ugly. I paint life as I'd like it to be. Um, and so, you know, here you have a man who worked for his, his entire artistic career, creating pictures, as he would call them, um, that relates to the American picture, American way of life or American way of life as he saw it, it relates to everyday people by using everyday, you know, his, his neighbors as everyday models. Um, and he, he created this narrative. His paintings are meant to be read. They're meant to be understood without a, a severe intellectual interpretation because you would, you would just, or you, in, you, you in tune yourself to the message that he's portraying. And they were very, very visual messages as they were made very popular by the Saturday Evening Post. So with that, I, Thank you very much. If you have a question, um, hopefully I can answer it. Um, and so there we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. I think that was fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now and we can have time for questions. Uh,